All right, guys. Well, here we are getting very close to the end of the Albuquerque series. I don't think I can wrap it up in one video right now. Maybe there's a lot to the end of it. Uh, it's a particularly complex story. So I'm going to try. I'm not going to waste time on introductions. Hopefully the death threats will stop. Uh, you suck. I listen to every one of your videos and I keep listening and I keep watching just to make sure that you still suck. You should be ashamed of yourself. You're a bitch. So for that guy, hello. This will be on YouTube, so like, comment, subscribe. Check out patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. If you haven't read my book, Wasting Talent, the links are also going to be in the pinned comments. And you can listen to it for free on Audible if you sign up. Then you get the first three titles for free. Okay, that's, see? Felt like if I'm going to do an introduction under a minute, then I should at least be able to plug some of my, my products. Okay, let's get uh, into the story. So last time, where we had left off... Um, I was in Bruno's hotel room. He had left. I was with his girlfriend and, well, I mean, if we're being honest, you're my side bitch, Shelly. And she had tried to tell me before. Like, she, remember, she, like, turned the TV down and she's like, I need to tell you something. I was like, all right, what's up? And then she did it. I didn't know what she was going to say, but then I asked her again and she told me that Bruno was an undercover cop. And that's where we left off last time. So I've been doing cocaine, right? And we all know that cocaine makes you insanely paranoid. And I have this theory with cocaine. I was just talking about it last night with somebody because I was in a weird situation where somebody else was on meth psychosis and I had to, I had to like go in and try to like talk them off the ledge or whatever. Um, I can do that sober. I don't like meth anyway. It's like one of those few drugs where if somebody's like, here, I'll give you this for free. It's like one of the few things where I can be like, nope. And then I feel good about it. I was like, I said, no. Recovery's strong right now. But, you know, other drugs, like if you put cocaine in front of me, heroin, it's usually doesn't end very well for me. But I have this theory that, you know, there were periods in my life during the Boston series. I had a kilo of Coke back then. I would stay up for days, if not a full week or a little bit more than that on cocaine. You know, there were times where I had psychosis to the point where I thought all my teeth fell out. And then like, I'd be so, and then I'd like come down off the Coke. I'd be like, oh, those were weird hallucinations. And I'd like give whoever I was with high five. I'd be like, oh, we're, we're not losers. It's totally normal shit to, you know, in, inflict on your brain and then there's also the period where during the how i made half a million dollars series where i was smoking six hundred dollars worth of crack a day now what would happen in these periods is well i guess so the how i made half a million dollar crack psychosis phase of my life is after this storyline but we're still going off the boston where i was doing i went through a kilo in like a, like a month or two a couple months it brought me to places of severe psychosis, cocaine-induced psychosis, where I thought my girlfriend was cheating on me. And then there's the other one where there's the fear that somebody's out to get you. Faceless fear. You don't even know what they look like. Like, if you really close your eyes and concentrate, you just see, like, a roll of, like, putty with, like, arms. And you're like, Ugh, that's terrifying. Oh, my, that's probably outside of my window. I'm going to look. And then you get stuck looking. It's, when I say faceless fear, it's not like you're not scared of police. You're not scared of people trying to hurt you that have a specific form. It's a faceless fear where you just are like, there's people out to get me. I'm just going to open the front door and surrender. Fuck, hey, I'm right here. Come get me. I don't care anymore. You get weird like that, right? When you've been plunged into that depth of psychosis so many times. Now, if I do a line of cocaine, within 20 minutes, I'm like going up to my girl and be like, what are you doing on your cell phone? Let me see your, uh, your app store history. I want to see if you have dating apps on there. She's like, huh? 
did you do a line again? I'm like, no. It's like blood coming in down my chin. Uh, I, I'm just, I have a headache. I gotta go. Instantly taken back into that cocaine psychosis because neurologically, this is my theory. I have no idea if what I'm saying is correct, but I think the wires get crisscrossed when you've been abusing it for long enough. And this happens with crystal meth. Any upper will do this to you. If you've been to these places of psychosis, just doing a nominal amount later on can bring you back. So when Shelly told me that, when she's like, hey, then undercover, I was like, I'm already on cocaine at that point. And sheer ter terror just washed over me. I was like, how do you know that? And she's like, remember the first day when I picked you guys up? I was like, yeah. You remember how he came out of that house and he was beat up bad? I was like, yeah. And so she goes to tell me that that first day when he'd come back and he had about two ounces of Coke. I don't know. It's an estimate there. He went in there to buy Coke. This was, The person at that house was somebody she knew. Uh, it was like her sister's boyfriend, some shit like that. The guy, he went in there. She had introduced Bruno to that guy. She hadn't known him that long. And he said that he was going to go in there and buy some blow for her, you know, because he was, I guess, and you do run into this in the drug world. He was like one of these sadistic people that doesn't do drugs. Or this, this was my first impression of him. I thought he was like a sadistic person that did drugs. And then would just, that like use those drugs to inadvertently fuel his like perverted stuff. He's a cuck. He's like, what's up for him, a cuck? I didn't talk to that yeah, dude. Every time I see a baboon make it with a white man, it makes my fucking blood boil in a good way. You know what I'm talking about? I'm like, sure, Bruno. But I guess he'd gone into this house to buy the Coke, and her friend, the person she knew, it was her sister's boyfriend, I believe that's what it was, something like that. I know this girl to this day. He recognized Bruno as being a cop, you know, he knew that he was an art. So he refused to sell it to him. And Bruno ended up beating him up and taking the Coke and then getting in the car. I mean, they got in like a fist fight, but Bruno won, overpowered him and took the Coke. Explains why he was all fucked up. He had a limp, face is all swollen. He never told us any of this shit, right? And I'm like, oh, that's normal, whatever. I mean, at that point, it didn't, nothing surprised me. I met that guy fighting him in a drunk tank. And so what she told me is after that happened that day, that guy's house got raided shortly after that. I don't know, a day, a day or two, freshly. And she had just found this out this morning when she told me. And the guys whose house got raided had told Shelly's sister that he was an undercover cop. You know, and they'd gotten in a fist fight. He got beat up. Then his house got raided. And he was positive. He's like, I'm 100% positive that dude's undercover. And I guess they looked into it and they figured out that it was actually true. That guy was out on bail. She's like, what are we going to do? He has my car, right? And uh, I was like, well, don't tell him you know. She's like, well, you got to stay with me. I was like, I can't stay around an undercover cop. There's no way I can do it, Shelly. You got to understand that. She's like, you're just like all the other guys. You just used me. I was like, I didn't use you. She's like, you used me so you could have a place to stay. I'm like, dude, that was that weirdo. I have nothing to do with that. So she was trying to get me to like stay with her. And I just wanted to leave. I mean, I don't want to be around these people anyway before that. And after she had told me that he was an undercover cop, honestly, it really made a lot of sense. When we were in that jail tank. He was unusually brave. The way, oh, these fucking, look at these fucking primates swinging from their fucking concrete blocks. These fucking baboons. Fucking disgusting. He was pretty confident. <laughs> There's like 20 black dudes in there and me and him. And I don't even count. I was like a defective at that point. I was like all... 
completely, um, you know, I was dope sick. What was I going to do? I wasn't going to back him up. If I threw a punch, I'd fart, you know? That's kind of exactly what had happened. So she's wanting me to stay, and I'm like, like I can't, you know? I had maybe 21 bucks in my pocket, something like that. I had, like, some cash. So what I wanted to do was take a cab over to Luke's and just demand that he find me a place to stay. This was his hometown. Like, it, it, it shouldn't... Go, it shouldn't be that unreasonable for him to find a place for me to stay. But of course, you know, I try to soften it and everything and make her feel better. And I'm like, look, because she couldn't leave because he had her car. I mean, that's pretty much what her, what she was saying. And I was like, give me your phone number. I'm going to go get with my friend. Same guy that you guys have taken me to earlier. Get away from him. And you can come to wherever I'm at. I'm going to be staying with somebody's house, whatever. She was scared. You know, because this guy was... That's kind of the worst breed of person, if you think about it. Like, he was a cop, but he was all, he also had this, like, sadistic streak to him. She definitely didn't want me to go, but I, I eventually I, I kind of used what I just said and talked my way out of it, and I left. I left the hotel, and I was already paranoid like you gotta understand that's why i was talking about the psychosis thing um it's like how i opened the video when i left that motel room i was in full-blown panic that this guy was gonna find me every car that passed looked like shelly's bright outside i don't remember how much dope i had but i had I had enough to get me like through the day you know um and I ended up, you know, leaving. And in my mind, I was like, okay, this is what the plan is going to be. Really, there was no point of staying out there, running around, trying to do this stuff for JP anymore. Um, you know, it, Luke wasn't being accommodating to me. And I, I kind of just thought, okay, I can call Kate's dad. And I can tell him that I'm ready to leave. He'll get me a plane ticket. And then when I get back to California, get 15 grand. Seemed like the most reasonable and I guess logical plan that I could have. But I was completely cracked out at that time. Well, I mean, you know, twacked out on the coke. So I ended up walking like a few blocks away. Again, like I'm paranoid. I'm thinking that every car that passes me is Shelly's car with Bruno driving it. Finally make it to this like nail salon. Walk in there. Some Asian girls were working there, and I asked them if I could use the phone. And of course, they were like, they're like, no long distance, you know, no long distance. And I was like, all right, yeah, of course not, you know. And uh, I go to call Luke. Doesn't pick up. It goes like straight to voicemail. I'm like, fuck. You know, because I need him to pick me up. Like I said, I had... 21 bucks, something like that. I had like a random amount of money in my pocket. So after I tried calling him like a few times, every time I was calling, it's going straight to voicemail. I decided to look up a taxi cab company. You know, back then there's big ass yellow page books. I mean, I, I don't even, do they still have those? You know, there's like the white pages with the, you know, it's like the business directory. I ended up finding a cab, called him. And I kind of knew how to get to his place, you know, um, before Bruno was the one that had gotten the directions, but it wasn't that far. So this cab comes and, you know, it's like some Middle Eastern dude. And I tell him that I don't really know because he asked me for the address and I'm like, I don't really know the address. Um, I kind of remember where it is. So, you know, I have... 21 bucks just please get me as close to where i think it is as possible now i was only going off like landmarks and shit and i remember that there was a grocery store in like this little you know um strip mall area that was the closest commercial thing to where he was and i remember passing it both times when we had 
gone to his place and, uh, and when Bruno and Shelly had driven me back to the hotel. So that was like the starting point. I explained to the guy where I thought it was. I was like, okay, it's at this grocery store. Um, some other stuff in there. I think there was a Foot Locker. I don't remember exactly what stores. It doesn't really matter. But we end up going to this grocery store and then we make a left like more into the residential neighborhoods that are surrounding it driving around. I have a terrible memory to begin with. Remember when, like when I was with the impotent dude and his girlfriend, it was really hard for me to find Kate's house. And I've been there way more than I've been to Luke's house. Um, you know, and I asked the, the cab driver if I could use the phone. He said, no, I cannot let customers use phone. Cause I didn't have a, I didn't have anything. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have an ID. So we're just kind of like driving around these residential neighborhoods probably go, I don't know, two, three miles away from there. I'm looking because back in that time, this like before Uber, taxis would have the little fare meter. I told the guy up front how much money I had. I didn't want to get in a situation where I got arrested or something because I didn't have enough money to pay him. We were like up to like $16 and I was kind of starting to panic because I couldn't find this guy's house can find Luke's house. And the neighborhood that we were in was like gargantuan houses, huge, huge houses, like statues of mermaids, like sucking off sailors and shit. It was like all up, you know, super wealthy crypt keepers like Luke's dad. It's like an entire fucking commune of that. <sighs> there was this very distinct sign in the beginning of Luke Street. I remembered it, you know, it was like Enchanted Meadows or whatever it was, you know, something like that. It was like to mark the community. Driving around and I finally see that. I'm like, oh, right, right here. We go down that street. And now I knew that we were going the right way. I was happy because we we're like up to like 19 bucks. Keep going. And all of a sudden... This is the kind of street, too, where it's gated houses. So it's just, you know, there's not cars parked on the street, typically. We roll up, there's probably like 15 cop cars parked in front of his house. I'm like, fuck. I'm already paranoid at this point. So I kind of like duck down. I'm like, yeah, yeah keep going, keep going. Because he doesn't know that that's the house that I'm trying to go to. I kind of like duck down in the back seat and I'm looking and I'm seeing all these cop cars. I'm like, fuck. His house got raided. I mean, it certainly looked that way. You know, and like I said, it was one of those neighborhoods where you don't see cars parked on the street. So we keep going. And at this point, I kind of, it kind of like sinks in how fucked I am. Can't go back to the hotel with Bruno and Shelly. Um, Luke obviously got arrested. I don't know if it has anything to do with Bruno or anything to do with what he was doing. I know that he was moving a lot of weed for JP's guys that were in Northern California. And, you know, on the East Coast, place like Connecticut, sometimes they trip on that. When you're moving 50 to 100 pounds of like high quality weed at a time, you can get busted. You know, it's all, they're they're tripping a lot less in California and stuff like that. But Connecticut, at least in that time, this was like 2005, 2006, it was still something that was, you know, <laughs> you catch a case really quick over it. So I didn't know what it was about, but I assumed that it had something to do with that. We keep going. And the guy's like, uh, where to? You know, it's like at $20 now on the meter. And I'm like, can you just pull over, man? I was like, can I please, please use your phone? I was like, if I can find my friend, then I'm going to be able to, um, then I'm going to be able to pay you even more money. So like, in fact, I'll give you double what the fare is. Please just let me use your phone. And he pulls out this like old ass new Kia that has like a plastic sheath on it. Like that's how long ago this was. He's like, okay. So I get on the phone and I'm going to call, um, Kate's dad. 
You know, I feel like at this point, maybe that's my only option. I call him, explain to him what's going on. No, I mean, not everything, but just kind of say that I'm stranded in Connecticut and I'm trying to take him up on his deal. So the guy hands me the phone and I go to reach in my pocket and I don't have the business card anymore. I have the room key instead. So I don't have his number. So I'm like, hey man, can I use 411? He's like, no, you charge. I'm like, dude, I'll, I'll throw you the fucking 30 cents that it is. No, you don't charge. I'm like, I know you don't know English that well, but I'll give you $100 if we can find my friend and you let me use 411 right now. He goes, no, give me phone back. Jesus Christ, dude. I just give him the money. I'm like, well, I don't have any more money. And you're not letting me call anyone, so... I guess I'm just gonna get out here. He's like, okay. I give you a ride back. To the grocery store. So he's willing to drive me back for free, because he had to go back that way anyway. You're gonna drive me back to the grocery store that was essentially like the landmark for how I found Luke's house. So we start driving back. I'm in the back seat. I'm pissed off. I'm coked out. I'm coming down off coke now, actually. But I'm still in this, like, paranoid, paranoid bit that I'm in. And I take out a Newport, and I just light it. Fuck it. Having a bad day. Hey, hey, come on, no, no smoking, man. What the fuck, man? I'm like, we're like driving. Now we're, we're like in some residential neighborhood past Luke's house. We, we ended up going past his house again. I saw the cops. I didn't see anything. I just saw these cop cars parked there. We're in some random residential neighborhood that I don't know. I flick the cigarette out the window. And I like... I have this card in my hand where I like pick it up off the seat and I just chuck it out the window. All pissed off. So he ends up driving me back to the grocery store. Get out. I was like, all right, thanks, man. And he drives off. No idea what I'm going to do now. There's like a pay phone kind of to the side of the parking lot, like by a sidewalk. I walk up to it. I call my dad, collect. My dad picks up. He's like, where are you? I was like, dad, I'm stranded in Connecticut. He's like, I thought you were getting a, an airplane ticket. Somebody was going to pay for a ticket for you to get out of there. He's like, well, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, I found myself in a bad situation again. He's like, well, what happened? I was like, I don't know, it doesn't matter. I was like, Dad, can you just get me a plane ticket out of here? He's like, I'm not going to do that. You know, he's like, I Western Union you money, and you told me that somebody else was going to get you a plane ticket. He's like, the people in Al-Anon keep telling me that I should kill you, chop you up into pieces, and mail your organs to Mexico. And I can maybe recoup some of my investment with you over the years. No, he didn't say that, but something to that effect. He basically said that one thing that he was working on and that he had been learning in Al-Anon was to put stip stipulations on enabling me. He'll help me do a, do, you know, to a certain point, but he's not gonna, um, but, but if I break my word with him, like, he'll make a deal with me, some hybrid deal. Like, yeah, I'll send you some money. Like, all right, well, I'm going to get a plane ticket out of here. If I don't follow through with my end of the bargain, then he doesn't help me any further. I'm like, come on, Dad. I'm going to be homeless again. I'm probably going to get arrested. I'm going to be calling you from jail. You're going to be, you're going to end up bailing me out. Can you please just get me a fucking ticket? He's like, well... F-bombs aren't in my wheelhouse. And he just hangs up on me. I was like, 
I, I swear, exact line too, like verbatim. I remember that so well. He's like, F bombs are to my wheelhouse. He's like, hello. There's just a dial tone. So I'm just like, so, you know, been in this situation many times in my life. End up sitting on this curb by this grocery store. I'm just sitting there. And my head in my lap, like, wake up periodically, and there's, like, crumpled up dollars. Somebody's like, have you ever thought of a program? I'm like, shut up. I'm not homeless. From Santa Barbara. Vicious. From the 805. I'm, like, sitting there whimpering and shit. I'm like, you know, I hate to do it. I'm gonna have to liquidate one of these gold coins. I mean, JP will understand. <laughs> hey man, these are IOUs. These are just as good as cash. I was only gonna do one. You know, I was like, all right, I'm gonna do one. So that's my next play. I'm gonna make it to a pawn shop. And that's the beauty of having gold coins like this. They're very easy to liquidate. Even if you're losing 20% on it, that's still what a typical money laundering service would take. So that's the best way to conceal large sums of money. I knew I could go to a pawn shop, I could sell it, and I could get cash on it. Probably take a 20% hit, you know. But I was with it, whatever. I'll pay him back. You know, in your junky mind, you're always like, yeah, I'll get three jobs if I have to. I'll pay the debt back. You lie to yourself. I'll learn a new trade. I'll do magic tricks for money. It doesn't matter. It's like this weird used car salesman fucking narration voice that comes in your mind and tells you that it's going to be okay. And then, you know what? 90 fucking 5% of the time, it's not. But you don't. I mean, as a drug addict, you're like, oh, whatever. My luck has to change at some point. So now I'm like trying to figure out where the closest pawn shop is. Again, go to this... Back to the payphone, looking in the yellow pages. Because back then, without the internet being on everybody's phone, you had to kind of like jump through all these hoops. It was super annoying. I find a pawn shop, you know, um, and now I just have to get there. So my whole plan is that I'm going to spange some money up, get another cab, make it to the pawn shop, sell a coin, use it to get on a plane, go home. You know, I still have the rest of this money. Who knows what happened to Luke? So I'm going up to people and I'm asking them for money and shit. I think I got like $10 real quick, you know? Um, and like, as I'm doing it, I don't know why I thought of it, but I go to my back pocket. There's nothing in it. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's weird. Where's the gold coins? But my other pocket, not there. Start having a complete freak out. I don't have the gold coins. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> not only did Luke get arrested, not only did I figure out that the guy that has been making me do sadistic sexual shit in front of his obese, lovely girlfriend, is an undercover cop, and I can't stay with them anymore. But now I've lost $4,500 of my friend's money, JP, who I've already fucked over. Again, I didn't know that then. But the reason he was sitting in jail at that time was because of me. I didn't tell on him or anything. I just did something very stupid. And we will find out about that soon. So now, getting home is not even important to me. I'm like, fuck. Like I told you, JP was a loyal ass guy. He was really one of my closer friends, but he was a functioning sociopath. He's like one of those guys that was like, yeah, check out these boots. It's made out of dead Vietnamese people's skin. It's an antique from the Vietnam War. Got it for 16 racks. Look. They said it was made with the 27-year-old skin. I guess it's more valuable when it's that number <laughs> or it's that age. Like that kind of guy, right? I mean, nice guy to his friends, but definitely had a touch of evil in him. And he was the kind of guy, or he was loyal to a fault, if he was your friend, 
But if you make enemies with that guy, he, I don't, he doesn't give a fuck. He will hunt you down. He will murder you. It's that kind of guy. Make boots out of you. Make snowboard bindings out of your rib cage. Sell it on the dark. Okay, anyway. So, yeah, there's part of me that wanted to help him and everything, but now I was fucking freaked out. I didn't have that kind of, that kind of money to me at that time in my life was like a seven-year salary. The only thing that I had going for me at that time was that Kate's dad told me that if I made it back to California, she'd, if I made it back to California, that he'd give me $15,000. Who knows if that's even true? All I knew is that there's no way I'm going to just not try to get that money back. Now, it was possible that it had fallen out of my pants. That's happened to me so many times. Or I lose, like, the last of my money. I lose drugs. I don't lose drugs that often, but I have before. But I was thinking when I was in that hotel room, I would get all paranoid and I would hide shit. I remember I was hiding rigs in there because Bruno wasn't cool with me shooting up. It all kind of made sense, too, like, in retrospect, after she had told me that he was an undercover cop. Like, you know, him being brave in the jail, him not wanting to see me shoot up, him not doing drugs with us. Seemed like a pretty believable thing. So I was like, all right, how am I going to get... I Like, at this point... I literally ran away from them. And don't forget, they had been driving me around. And they were promised a pound of weed. This is before I knew that he was a cop. But I didn't even want to know what would happen if I went back there. He seemed like one of those cops that was like, definitely villainous. You know, like one of those crooked cops that, well, obviously he's giving some hood rat cocaine and, like, making her suck my dick in front of him. It's not typical police officer behavior. At least I don't think so. Maybe Tom Sizemore should. In that, was that him in Natural Born Killers? Or was that Robert Downey Jr.? I don't know. It doesn't matter. So then I, it, like, just instantly dawned on me. I was like, wait a second. Oh my God, I threw the card. I threw the hotel room key card because I was mad and I was in the back of this cab and he had told me to stop smoking and I threw the cigarette and then I threw the card. I actually had the fucking hotel card to get back into the room. All I had to do was go back to the hotel, wait for him to leave and then I could just go in there and get it. I was almost positive that it was under the mattress. Like I said, it was possible that I had lost the, the coin the three coins. <clears throat> but it was more than likely that when I was all coked out of my mind that I hid it either under the mattress, there was a couple other places like in the bathroom, there's, there's other like weird hiding places, like there was like this shelf of towels, put my rigs and shit up there. Thought maybe I'd put it there. At least if I like could get in the room, I could, I, I thought there was probably like a 75% chance that I could get the coins back. But now I threw the card in a random place. I didn't even know, like, I kind of knew where, like, it was pretty much a labyrinth. You know, this nice area was like a bunch of these different, you know, complex streets that I didn't know, but the cab driver would. So I was like, all right, I'm going to call the cab driver who wasn't cool to begin with. Well, I mean, I guess he drove me back to the grocery store. And I'll have him take me back to that neighborhood. Now it's imperative that I find that card. I had no idea where I threw it either. I was thinking the only person that would know is him. So I ended up staying in this grocery store parking lot. And I kept spanging. At that point, I didn't look clean cut. You know, I looked like... I looked like a drug awareness poster. You know, like, my hair was super greasy. I think I had a soul patch. I was like, hey, man, uh, can you spare three bucks? The zits everywhere. Looks like a constellation. 
but people would give me money. I don't know. I think that, you know, because I just go up to people and I tell them that I was stranded here. Hey, you know, I found out that my girl was cheating on me and we got in this huge blowout fight. I'm not even from here. I'm just trying to get home. So I'm going to be like, all right, here's 40 cents. Good luck, man. But after a while, this shit starts adding up and, you know, I think I spanged up like 25, 26 bucks, whatever it was. And then I couldn't remember which cab company it was. And that was ridiculous, you know, because that ate up a bunch of my change. Went to the phone booth and I started calling different cab companies and that try being in the situation where you, where you don't remember which cab company you called and then having to explain what you need out of them. You're like, hey, um, I think I may have taken a cab from you guys earlier today. And, well, um, do you know the address of the place we're trying to go? No, listen to me. I think, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that you guys picked me up earlier today, or one of your cabs picked me up, and I dropped something, and I'm trying to get a hold of the same cab driver that gave me the ride earlier so that I can try to get the thing that I dropped. Oh, lost item. Hold on. No, not lost item. God damn it. And then like some other guy, hello, can you describe the item that you left in the cab? I'm like, no, I didn't leave anything in the cab per se. I threw it out the window. What do you mean window? What do I, what do you mean? The fucking window. In the back, that you roll down. I was in a cab. I threw something. Hello? And then, you know, you hear a dial tone. This show went on for like two hours. I don't remember how much dope Luke had given me, but I remember that I went into the grocery store after being very frustrated about not being able to find this particular cab company. Even if I did find the cab company, I'm like thinking in my mind like, well... There's probably like a 7% chance that I'm going to be able to talk to the right person that I'm going to be able to find this. I remember going to the grocery store, went into the bathroom and I did my last shot. It was like the last of it. Um, and then I was like really fucked at this point. You know, I'd kind of already in my mind, my plan was that I was going to go to a pawn shop and sell back one of the gold coins. I was going to use that money to get back to California, I was going to call Kate's dad, collect on the money that he said that he would give me if I got out of there, and then I would be able to give him the two coins plus the cash, and I would be good to go. That was my delusional plan that definitely didn't work, but that's what I was thinking at the time. So after I did my last shot, I was like, all right, got to get lucky. I kept calling cab companies. Finally. I thought of telling the cab companies that I got picked up at a nail salon. I like changed my story. I was like, hey, I got picked up by na at a nail salon today. I got a ride up to one of my friend's houses. And while I was driving up there, I threw something out the window and I'm just trying to figure out where I was going. Do you have anybody that picked anyone up at a nail salon today? Eventually, I talked to the right company, you know, in... You're probably like, well, I mean, how many cab companies can there be? It wasn't even, it was just how I was like explaining it on the phone. These people like, it was like too much for them to understand or something. I mean, it was just kind of a weird thing what I was trying to ask. Finally, one of the cab companies is like, oh yes, Omar picked somebody up at the nail salon this morning at 11.45 a.m. But he's not working today. All right, he's off work now. And I'm like. Now, walking, walking distance from the grocery store to where I may have thrown the card, probably would have taken me like two hours. So I'm like, and it's like probably four in the afternoon at this point. Like, it's going to get dark at a certain point. I have no cell phone, so I have like no flashlight. You know, it's not like today. People take for granted how convenient fucking technology is. Now, if you have an iPhone... It's like having a 
survival kit. You have GPS on there. You have the internet. You have a fucking flashlight. Back in that time, before all that, you were screwed in a situation like this. I spent all day trying to get a hold of these cap companies, and I couldn't. Finally, they tell me that the driver that had taken me earlier from the nail salon was off work. He'd be in tomorrow at 9 a.m. My only play was to walk up, try to figure out where I'd gone. It's the only thing that I could think to do. And I was out of dope at this point, so it was like kind of imperative. It was like the only move that I had left. So I walk up, I walk from the grocery store up to this residential neighborhood, I'm covered in sweat. It's like cold. So it's like the cold hits the sweats, make me feel all shitty, even though I'm, you know, I'm, I'm loaded at the time. By the time I get up there, it gets dark. I'm just looking around. I'm like, this is ridiculous kind of like crawling on my hands and knees, picking up pieces of paper and shit. People are driving by. I like look up. I'm like this like, looks like I'm some dope fiend that like escaped from some like experimental drug testing lab. And I'm just like, just start barking at people. Eventually, I just decide to give up, you know? Like, what a waste of fucking time. Furthermore, I don't even know if they're still there. They might have gotten weirded out that I just took off like that. You know? Maybe he arrested Shelly. Who knows what this guy was trying to do? So I'm like, couldn't find this card up in the residential neighborhood, and I just ended up walking back to the grocery store. By the time I got back, it was like 7 at night. I was so fucked. You know, I had nowhere to stay. I had no money. Call my dad again from the payphone collect. It's like, my dad's not trying to hear it. He's like, what, you think a few hours goes by and now I'm just suddenly going to help you? So that night... I end up going back into that gro this grocery store that I was at was 24 hours. I kind of just walk around for a while and they, it was one of those places like most grocery stores where when you go to the bathroom there, it's like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like the inventory place of the grocery store. So I go back in there, you know, like, like I'm going to the bathroom and I find this little area with like all these crates and shit. Perfect little fort for me to hide in without being noticed. And I just go and I kind of like curl up in a ball. Go to sleep. Wake up. And I don't know how much time has gone by at this point. But I didn't feel good. I wasn't like full blown sick. But like my nose was running and I was starting to feel the chills. I was getting goose pimples and shit. And I was just like, fuck. Walk out of there. There's like a dozen people in this grocery store. I asked some lady, I was like, hey, do you know what time it is? She's like, it's 7 a.m. I was like, oh. End up going back to my little nook. Surprised nobody saw me in there. Sleep in there. I actually do fall asleep again, too. When I wake up, it's like 10.30 in the morning. So I successfully stayed at this place overnight without anybody noticing. Full-blown dope sick at this point. Full-blown. Feel like shit. I remember going to the bathroom, diarrhea, all that. Having diarrhea, there's like tears streaming down my face. I'm like, I'm like, bemo you know, I'm moaning. It sounds super, I'm like, ah, sexual, dope, sick fucking diarrhea. 
I ended up going out. Now I knew the cab company at least to call. I can, I knew the guy's name. His name was Omar. I go back to the payphone. I call him and I'm able to have that guy come pick me up at the grocery store. So he comes and gets me. And this guy must think that I'm a straight up crackhead, you know? He's like, he's like, so, do you know where to go now? I was like, no. I was like, do you remember when I was smoking a cigarette in the back of the car yesterday and you told me to put it out? I threw the cigarette out. Was, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like, it was like 14 hours ago. Why, how would I not remember that? <laughs> of course, not everybody's a crackhead like me. <laughs> My bad. I was like, well, I accidentally threw my house key outside. The same area that you made me do that. So I have some money. Same thing. Get the meter running and help me try to find this key. He's like, oh, okay. So we end up getting in the cab and we go up to this, we go up to this neighborhood. Now, it's funny because the first time we had gone, I knew that the grocery store was like the landmark to look for. Now, at least I knew where Luke Street started. So I was like, all right, that's a good place to start. You know, we like there's like this big sign. It's like the entrance to a street. So we get up to that. We go back to where his house is. There's no cop cars there anymore. I was like, all right, keep going. Make a left, make a right. All right, go a little slower. So now we're going slow. I'm looking. I have no idea where I threw this. I don't even know if we're on the right street. It's probably going like four miles an hour. We're just, he's like, he's like, I don't, what, I don't like, what, do you, I don't know what you expect to find. Keep going, and I'm like, just about to give up, and I see this little kind of like shimmer of white. And there's, you know, this is like, in like a gutter. There's like a gutter, there's like a sidewalk, and there's like, you know, the gutter. It's all this like wet leaves and shit in it. And I see this little shimmer of white. I was like, stop the car! He's like, stops the car suddenly. I get out of the car, and I go look, and I find it. I fucking found the key. I could not believe that I found it after all that shit. I was so happy. I was like, Yes! At this point, pretty much spent all the money, you know, looking around, doing this on the meter. He had, same thing as the day before. He ends up dropping me off at the grocery store. So I'm back at the grocery store. I have the card now. So now all I have to do is go back to the hotel and kind of like do some stakeout work, you know, and try to figure out whenever Bruno leaves, if he's still there. Good thing is that I know what Shelly's car looked like. So if it's parked in the parking lot, I know they're there. If it's not, I know that they're not there. You know, and like I said, there's a good chance that they may have already checked out of this uh, motel. So when I get back to the grocery store, I start spanging again. This time, it's a little different because I'm full-blown dope sick at this point. Like, I'm like wiping away snot with the back of my hand and I'm going up to people and I'm like, give me eight bucks! I seem like a completely crazy person. This is an upscale part of Connecticut. Doing that for a while. Eventually a cop shows up, you know? I think I made like six bucks. I was just trying to raise enough money just to get back to the hotel. Not even to get dope. Or I didn't even know where to get dope in this place. It's one of those towns where there wasn't a ghetto. Cop comes up to me. He's like, hey man, we've gotten some complaints that you're loitering. That you're begging for money. Uh, a couple people said you smelled like shit. I was like, oh, God bless those understanding Connecticut fucks. We're going to have to ask you to leave. Hey, where are you from, man? You have any idea on you? No idea on me, you know? And uh, I gave them my information everything. They're like, all right, yeah, sit on the curb for me. I'm like, great. I'm sure some warrant's going to come up. I mean... I've been arrested in Worcester. I've been arrested in upstate New York. I thought for sure something was going to come up. Kept me detained for maybe like five minutes. All right, you're good to go. You just can't be in this in the strip mall. Like, all right. So I start walking back, like down this commercial street. 
thinking that maybe I can make it to the to the hotel. But the thing is, is I'm so dope sick at that point. It's take it's like I'm handicapped by it. Like I'll walk like eight, nine, ten feet. And like gas will bubble up in my stomach to the point where it feels like feels like I'm going to shit my pants. I'm literally walking down the street with my hand over my asshole because I'm scared that there's going to be this like violent outburst and shit's just going to splinter through my fingers or something. So I end up sitting down on this curb. And I've got to be honest, I start crying. You know, I'm not in front of any commercial businesses or anything i'm just like on a curb kind of like in between where that strip mall was and whatever's down the street more commercial stuff i'm just sitting there crying like babbling crying too because i was crying because i was dope sick i was frustrated and i'm probably there for like two or three minutes just crying some lady probably in her 50s, sees me on the side of the road and pulls over and is like, are you okay? And I was like, no. My sister just died. I lost my wallet. I'm stuck here. She's like, oh my God. What can I do? I was like, I'm staying at this hotel. And I show her the key. It has like the name of the motel written on it. I was like, can you give me a ride? She's like, yeah, you got to sit in the back, though. Is that okay? I was like, yeah, no problem. And she had this, like, big-ass Labrador dog. This random lady in Connecticut picks up a crying dope fiend. Now, I looked like a dry... And remember, I smell like complete shit. It's funny, though, because I was wearing, like, pretty preppy outfit compared to, you know, what I had started my journey in. Do you remember, like, the impotent dude and his hippie girlfriend had let me use some of his clothes, and then when I met up with Luke, he gave me some, like, preppy clothes. So that's probably the one saving grace is that I didn't have that kind of shit on anymore, but I still stunk. So I'm in the back seat. She's, like, making small talk with me. She's like, how old was your sister? I was like, 30. You know, and we're just talking, and this dog just keeps licking me, licking me. It's like licking my face. He's like one of those, like, really, like, over-eager, annoying dogs. It's making me nauseous. Like, when you're dope sick, you're, like, hypersensitive to smell, and this dog just smells like, like, I don't know. I'm. It smells like wet dog. That smell is disgusting. It keeps licking me, and I try to roll down the window, but the child safety's lock is on. And I'm like, hey, can you roll down the window? I don't feel good. She's like, oh my. And she's like trying to undo it and I can't hold it anymore. And I pu I literally puked on the window of this back seat. She's like, oh my God. And she slams on the brakes. She's like, oh my God. That's awful. Are you all right? I was like, yeah, I'm fine. So she like pulls over. We end up getting like, dirty clothes, like dirty shirts and shit that she has in the trunk. I'm sitting there like wiping it off with her. I'm like completely dope sick at this point too. And I think that she knows it. Her attitude went from being like bumbly and nice to like, you're on drugs. But she didn't say that, but like, I could say, I puked right on her window. Like I could tell that she was upset. Well, that's what you get for picking up random hitchhiking dope fiends. I wasn't even hitchhiking. I was just sitting on the curb crying and this chick ended up picking me up. I helped her clean it up. We ended up just leaving these t-shirts filled with vomit like on the side of the road. She's like, do you want to come sit up front with me? I think it's better. She like didn't want me to, she's like, I don't want my dog to get hepatitis. She didn't say that, but that's, I think that's what she was thinking. So anyway, so finally, this lady ends up bringing me to the motel. It had the logo and shit emblazoned on it so she knew where this particular place was and she dropped me off when she dropped me off she gave me forty dollars it was a nice lady so she definitely was judging me but i don't know she ended up giving me 40 bucks so now i'm at this motel and i see that bruno or i see that shelly's car's parked there 
which I was happy about. You know, I was definitely feeling like shit. But now I had hope that I was going to be able to actually get in that room because he did leave from time to time. You know, he left to get food and shit. So there's this. They, like where their room was, was like it was on the lower level. This is like a two level motel. This lady dropped me off. And outside of the room, if you went to the left, there was like a vending machine. There's this little like, you know, vending machine room with like, there's the ice machine in there. And if you keep going, there's like this hallway that like forks off to the left. It's like the perfect place for me to hide in that little corridor that goes to the left. It's like, it's like an emergency door right there, but I can like hide and from that vantage point, I can stay by the vending machine and I can see the room that Bruno and Shelly are staying in. So my whole plan at this point is to wait for them to leave. At least him. You know, I told Shelly that I would take her with me. And I was planning on letting her know about the coins. If they hadn't found them yet. Like, I still didn't know for sure if they had found them. Now, of course, I'm dope sick, so regardless of having this plan or not, this little voice in my mind is telling me that I should probably try to go find some dope. You got to understand how nice this fucking town is. It's like almost impossible. Like, to, you probably have a better chance of playing a $1 scratcher and making $100,000 than you do of finding heroin in a town like this. Like, it was just super upscale. The heroin addicts wore like bow ties. They're like, yes, I'm addicted. I got addicted into the theater club. Well, now I do heroin, so what? They were like very sophisticated martini drinking junkies in this town. It was nothing like other places that I've been. You know, Santa Barbara is pretty upscale too. So I'm thinking that I'm going to give it like 30 minutes, which in dope sick time is like 10 hours. And if I don't see them leave the room, then I'm going to go try to find something. I don't know. I mean, again, junkie optimism. Like, I'll figure it out. Fuck it. <laughs> the odds? Fuck the odds. So I end up going to this vending machine area. And from there, I could see the room. So I'm, I'm kind of like squatted down, waiting. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. I don't know how much time goes by, but probably 20 minutes. I had cigarettes. So I'm like smoking cigarettes in this little vending machine room, blowing it out the door. And finally, I see Bruno open his hotel door. So I kind of like walk backwards into the vending machine area so that he can't see me. Now, still, from where I'm at, I'm, like, kind of hidden in the shadows of this little vending machine room. A lot of motels have a setup like this. And I see him walk to the car. I'm like, all right, I can't be this lucky. I just showed up and just happened to hit him at the right time. So I'm kind of, like, crawling out making sure that I don't walk out because then he'd be able to see me, but I'm kind of like crouched down and I look into the parking lot and I still see the car, but I've lost him. I don't see him, but the car's still parked there, but I saw him leave the room and I'm like, fuck. So I walk back into that area that I talked about, the little hallway and it like kind of like makes an L into this little emergency exit place. I go to press the door because I'm kind of getting like paranoid that he's going to find me there. And I go to press the door and it won't open. It's like locked. It's an emergency exit. And it's like one of those doors that you push. Like it has like one of those like metallic bar things that you push. And in theory, it's supposed to open, but it won't open. It's like locked. So I'm basically trapped in there. I'm like, fuck. But I still hide right by where the door is. I'm like, don't want to be in the vending machine area anymore. I'm like waiting in there for a while. Nothing happened. 
So I like walk out by the vending machine and I look and I don't see his car. I'm like, perfect. Walk up to the hotel room. Put the, and I look around the parking lot. His car is nowhere to be found. Press the, you know, I, I put the key inside of the door. Turns green. I open it. It's dark in there. You know, the the, the blinds are, are, are closed. I walk in, turn the light on, close the door. And he's sitting. Shelly's not in there. Bruno is sitting at the little table where that pound, where the pile of Coke was, where Shelly and I have been snorting it for the last few nights. He's just sitting there and he's looking dead at me. And we will conclude this. We have one more video in this, in the next installment of the Albuquerque series. Please like, comment, subscribe. Check out patreon.com slash Ryan Leone.